Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the key aspects of Stoic moral theory is its emphasis upon fulfilling our duties. And the word that we translate as duty is kathekon in Greek and aphikion in, in Latin. Aphikion was used as the translation for the kathekon as Stoicism made its way into Rome. And when we hear this term duty, or you could think of it as obligation, there's several questions that come to mind which Stoicism is going to provide an answer to, and Epictetus is going to provide an answer to in particular. So one of them would be, well, what is it to actually have an obligation or a duty? More important and more pressing than that is, you know, a question that requires us to get a bit more specific. And that's, well, what are, in fact, my duties and who do I, do I have them towards? And how can I know what they are so that I can fulfill them? The answer that Epictetus is going to provide us fairly consistently is that it has to do with roles and relationships. So, you know, sesis uh, is, is the uh, word that's used for um, relationship. I don't have it here on, on the board, but it's not that important. What is important is, is this notion that we as human beings don't begin, you know, in a sort of vacuum where we're individuals first and then only after that come into contact with other individuals and then acquire duties or anything along those lines. We're born into a, a matrix, a web of relationships. And these, in their specifics, have to do with us, right? I'm born as the son of so-and-so, but it's not as if I'm the first son in the world. So that whole relationship of son to mother or to father or brother to sibling or, you know, uh, playmate to other playmate, these have been around for a long time. And we can come to some sort of general ideas about what is, what is involved in those sorts of relationships. So what Epictetus tells us is that the names that the person bears, the onomata, onomata, sorry, in, in Greek, uh, those reveal a person's duties. So what are the sorts of names that we're talking about? I mentioned some familial relations. Husband-wife would be another example. Uh, when you have a child, you know, being a father, being a mother. Polite, citizen. Um, being a member of a, a political community. Being a, a resident of a particular town. Joining a club. Um, being a neighbor. You know, this term neighbor itself carries some, some weight with it. Why did you behave in that way towards that person? Well, I thought it was the right thing for me to do because they're my neighbor. When you ask people, you know, why they uh, took on the, the obligations that they did to help out those who they, they live with, and they say things like that, Epictetus would say they are recognizing what is inherent in there. Fellow traveler. Now we're getting to things that seem quite contingent, right? ruler and subject, or, uh, you know, we, we don't just simply have to have it be, you know, political ruler and political subject. It's archon and archomenon, um, in that the one who gives the orders, who arranges things, and the one who follows the orders, the one who obeys. Finally, human being in general. Um, even that tells us how we ought to behave but only if we really think through what, what these uh, involve. So each of these roles has its own specific duties, and he gives you some examples in chapter 10 of, of book 2, but he's going to bring these up over and over again.
The most general one, he says, you're to begin with a human being. That is, one who has no quality more sovereign than moral choice, but keeps everything else subordinate to it in this moral choice itself, free from slavery and subjection. So if you understand yourself in that way, that tells you, well, you ought to then behave in this way and not behave in that way. And you ought to behave towards other human beings in a similar way. He says, you're separated from wild beasts, you're separated from sheep. In addition to this, you are a citizen of the world and a part of it. Not one of the parts destined for service, but one of primary importance. For you possess the faculty of understanding the divine administration of the world and of reasoning upon the consequences. Um, so, you, you know, he, he goes on, and, you know, look, if you believe this sort of thing, if this is the way you see things, then you're going to behave in certain ways, not only in terms of yourself, but in terms of other people who are also human beings. If you are a citizen of the world, you are going to act accordingly. Um, he gives you a couple other great examples. He says, bear in mind that you're a son. What is the profession of, of this character? To treat everything that is his own as belonging to his father, to be obedient to him in all things, never to speak ill of him to anyone else, nor to say or do anything that will harm him, to give way to him in everything and to yield him precedence, helping him insofar as is within his power. And, you know, some of this may be, we might say, culturally conditioned, so that perhaps we don't want to say, I should go along with everything that my father says. Um, but, you know, if you are behaving as a child, showing filial, um, not just affection, but filial piety or, you know, filial relationship to the parents, there is a kind of um, subordination that is going to take place. Not, not a subordination of saying, oh, I, I don't matter at all, but a subordination of one's own will, letting your parent, um, you know, maybe tell the same story several times without calling them on it, going and help them change their, their tires or rake their leaves or things along those lines, right? Uh, we can look at any other rule in, in a similar way. Am I a husband? Well, then there's certain things incumbent upon me as a husband. Am I a father? There's certain things incumbent upon me as a father. Um, am I going to be a teacher? Well, then there's certain things I ought to be doing as a teacher as well. Likewise, a student, you know, we can go all the way down the line with this. And you can read the other examples in um, section, uh, in, in chapter 10 of, of book 2. I don't need to go through all of them. In chapter 14, he uses two terms that are kind of important to think of. He, he talks about relations, and he mentions that some of them are natural, fusikos, fusikas, sorry, and some of them are uh, acquired, apathetus. And so, you know, this makes sense for us as well. When I decided that I was going to become a professor, um, which, you know, happened quite a, a long time ago, so long that it almost feels natural, that was actually a chosen thing. When I got married, that was a, a choice. Um, I suppose you could say to a certain extent to have children is also a choice as well. It's one that creeps up on, on many people and surprises them, right? Um, you know, but being a son, being a brother or sister, you don't have much choice about that. Where you were actually born, you know, you can move somewhere else, but you can't really change the fact that you were born here or there and you did belong to that community. So we have all these complex relations that, that overlap with each other, that intersect, and we can not only see how we ourselves ought to behave in accordance with them, we can see other people. That's where this, this chart here is going to come in. See, our duty is really to maintain the faculty of choice, the pro racist that part of us that's at the core, Epictetus says, in accordance with nature. So if we are fulfilling our duties towards others, we are, in fact, improving upon ourselves, that, that part of ourselves that is the faculty of choice, the, the highest part of the human being. Every human being has that. So when we have some sort of relationship, it could be any of these, right? We have two people, I'm keeping it kind of simple because, you know, we can have more complex relationships, but we have two people. And each of them has a role in relation to the other. It could be the same role, you know, as in friends, 
with each other. Although even friendships aren't always about each person getting exactly the same thing from the other person. Um, but there's, there's some sort of role that each of them bears towards each other. And each of them has their own faculty of choice. They are a free being who can choose how they're going to act. And they do, in fact, act towards the other person. Here's where the Stoic doctrine becomes very uncompromising. It says, look, you should focus on your side, as I say, clean your side of the street before worrying about you know, what the other person's side looks like. Focus on your faculty of choice. If you're a son, you don't have a choice about whether you're a son, but you do have a choice about whether you fulfill the duties of being a son. That's not going to necessarily make your parent like you or behave the right way towards you. They could be a screw-up. They could be a terrible person. And Epictetus would say, that's got nothing to do with you. You can fulfill your duties in relation to them, even if they are not fulfilling their duties in relation to you. That's their loss. That's the, their own damage to themselves. It's not really harming you if they don't give you certain things because they're not harming your faculty of choice. They are not keeping you from being able to do what you ought to do. Now, you know, what do we say? Oh, they make me so mad. I can't, I can't stand being with them. Or, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I'd love to be, you know, nice to them, but they're not nice to me. And Epictetus would say, well, those are kind of cop-outs. You actually can do that if you choose to do it, but you're not choosing to do it, and you're coming up with justifications afterwards that'll let you keep on thinking that way. That might be why the other person's acting like a jerk as well, if they're not fulfilling what they ought to do. He doesn't really talk so much about, you know, the role of good examples, but that might fall into here as well. You know, you, you come to realize, oh, I haven't been fulfilling my duties towards this other person who is fulfilling their duties towards me. Maybe, you know, I would be better off if I was doing that, if I was using my faculty of choice in, in the right way. So all of this gives us a very not necessarily clear in, in a general sense, but a pretty clear in a specific sense, idea about how we ought to behave towards various people in our lives. Now, of course, if we're totally mixed up about what it means to, say, be a father, or what it means to be a fellow student, then knowing these names is not by itself going to be enough. We need some, some clarification, but Stoic philosophy could, could provide that. In any case, uh, Epictetus is going to insist that our roles and relationships reveal our duties. 